Hello, everybody, and welcome to part three in our new series, Understanding the Magdalene. If this is your first time on this channel, first of all, welcome. I'm very, very happy to have you, but I would definitely suggest going back and listening to part one and part two first before continuing with part three. Both part one and part two will be down in the description box below. I personally have had such an overwhelming positive response to this series and frankly I had no idea if people would even be interested in doing this series or not so I am very very grateful to all of you who have reached out with your words of encouragement. In last week's episode we ended with the darkness um, about the writer talking about discovering her place back in the beginning back in the womb of the mother. We also talked about the divine light of sovereignty within each individual person, that spark of God. And we also covered or started to cover the concepts of twin flames. As the author said so eloquently, Mary Magdalene was the one who loved the Christ the most. That was because Mary Magdalene was and is the twin flame of the person we know as Yahshua or Jesus. In this great awakening, we are now understanding that the two of them together made the Christ consciousness. Now, as I mentioned in part one, ever since I was about 16 years old, I've had this relationship with the Magdalene. If you remember from part one, I said how her name got stuck in my head when I was a teenager. And of course, this was long before the internet was accessible to a lot of people, long before I had really any interest in diving deep into these what we call biblical characters. But again, throughout my whole life, this woman, this mysterious, magical woman has been there. A lot of people pointed out last week in the video that there were many orbs around me at a particular time. This is happening more and more frequently, not just to me, but to other people in this community, and I'm sure to you as well. It's easy for us to see these orbs because we're on camera. But again, even for those of you who aren't on camera, I am sure that you also have this intense protection and guidance around you. And again, as the veil starts to thin and as our own vibrations rise, these entities around us will be more visible. Well, something interesting I want to share with you guys is that those orbs in my last video apparently were the Magdalene herself. When I found this out, I became extremely emotional because a part of me does feel like this is her series and she is the one directing this, not me. I'm just the conduit. However, going forward, I do hope that you and me together, that we can bring her legacy, her lineage, and her magic back to humanity. So again, as most of you know, the first part of this series we are reading through Megan Watterson's Mary Magdalene Revealed. And if you have the same copy of the book that I have, we are going to be starting on page 15, which is titled The Christianity We Haven't Tried Yet. Then Peter said to him, you have been explaining every topic to us. Tell us one other thing. What is the sin of the world? The Savior replied, there is no such thing as sin. Mary chapter 3 verse 1 through 3. I'm not sure what I was expecting when I first went to church as a little girl. Yes, I do. I was expecting the outside to be like the inside. I wanted the great big unsayable love I felt within me to be seen or witnessed outside of me. Back then, before I felt separated from it, there was this wide expanse of love inside me, like my own private ocean. And so I guess I was expecting for church to be this place where everyone walks around and greets each other, from one ocean to another, their innermost self right there on the surface, their inner world rising up from the depths of the breath of fresh air, a place where we can hang our mask at the door and just help each other be human. A place that reminded me how to be here in the world while not forgetting the part of me that is not of it. But that wasn't what it was like. I am not a Christian, though I baptize myself many times. Like the fiery Turkish prophetess from the first century, Thecla, who was denied by Paul when she told him that she was ready to be baptized. She said to him, only give me the seal of Christ and no trial will touch me. But he didn't think she was ready. He told her to be patient. Thecla knew her own heart, which is why I love her. And instead, she cut her hair short and baptized herself. 
I didn't hear about Thecla until I was a young adult in seminary, where I learned the Acts of Paul and Thecla date back to 70 AD, which makes it as ancient as any of the Gospels in the New Testament. This was the beginning of my education, or my re-education, that what I was searching for was within Christianity, but not of it. Thecla wasn't remembered as the first prophetess. Her story didn't set the precedent for the voice of the women in the church hierarchy. It was far too filled with truth we weren't ready for back then, because for Thecla, salvation was something she found within herself. I absolutely agree with this. This again goes back to the idea of gnosis. And again, as we've talked about the matrix of religion, the matrix of the church, they don't want you to believe that you can do this yourself, which frankly is exactly what Jesus taught. Yahshua taught that you have that inside of you. You are the direct link to source. Nobody else comes through you. And as I have said many times, when you take your first breath in this world, that is between you and God. God breathed life into man and man stood up. Nobody else is there to give you that breath. The doctors don't give you that breath. Your parents don't give you that breath. God does. So this salvation lies within you. The baptisms in my life, which are more accurately just ecstatic skinny dips, have come as markers when I feel like I was expressing more faithfully what's within me. When I am no longer denying or silencing this quiet, unassuming voice inside of me. I'm not a Christian but I find myself having to make that distinction often or that I need to make certain no one mistakes me as one. I wasn't raised religious. I was raised feminist. My great grandmother, Big Margie, who was tiny but had a presence so large it seemed to enter the room before she did, was a suffragette. She would whisper crazy comments to me when I sat on her lap like, it's fine if you want to become a wife and a mother, just make sure you get paid for it. My dad's mom, um, who was the original black sheep of our family, she was very much a feminist. Um, she was a pianist for a very long time. Uh, she went to college in an age where women did not go to college or university, and she actually graduated valedictorian of her college class. She went back to school later in life, became a therapist. She played the piano for church on Sundays, but she also had books on reincarnation and she would actually hide them under the bed for my grandfather, which is kind of funny. Um, she tried to teach me to meditate when I was like eight years old. My grandmother, Marianne, on my dad's side was just super cool, but she herself had aunts who were suffragettes and she would talk a lot about that, about the woman's right to vote, the woman's right to work. And the funny thing is, is even though my grandmother was a huge feminist and was super awake and, and very much into the metaphysical, she was also a Republican, so I find that, that very funny, but um, I kind of laugh at this because I would hear stories from her about her great aunts who were in the suffragette movement. My mom marched, marched for civil rights acts and for the Equal Rights Amendment and taught me to protest for women's rights when Roe v. Wade was in danger of being overturned. I was 13 and my little sister was just a toe-headed three-year-old. Her Planned Parenthood t-shirt came down to her knees. Now, I am very much against Planned Parenthood. I think most of us watching are. But again, this book was written long before um, The Great Awakening started. So do keep that in mind as we proceed forward with this book. I was holding her hand when an elderly woman approached me, clutching a pro-life poster with an iron grip. She came right up to me until we were awkwardly chest to chest. She hated me. I felt it. It was visceral. I mean, she hated who she thought I was. She was so angry as she smoked that small beads of spit landed on my face. She said, how many will be enough for you? I had no idea what she was asking me. I wasn't there because I thought I would ever have an abortion myself. I was there because I knew that if anything was holy, it was the relationship between myself and my own body. It was too intimate for anyone outside of me to ever shame or control. I've always felt that I would have to rewrite the history of Christianity to officially become a part of it. No, I would have to turn back the globe like Superman when Lois Lane dies and make certain they get the message straight from the start. Or the message is I have come to believe in it. That we are not inherently sinful or unworthy in any way. And that we should not feel shame for how human we are or how often we break, lose faith, and make wildly misguided mistakes. And I actually do agree with that. For most humans, humans who are not 
psychopaths or narcissists, you will make mistakes in life. You will do bad things. But if you're able to use that, those mistakes and actually learn from them and grow from them and create wisdom from them, then were they really mistakes? When I went to church for the first time as a little girl and read the Bible, I broke out in hives. I couldn't reconcile the feminism I had been raised in with the idea that God was a father and that salvation only came through his son Jesus and therefore men held this exclusive right being the same sex as the father to speak on behalf of him and we do know from a lot of the missing books of the Bible that Yahshua Jesus actually referred to God as father mother um, we definitely see a lot of this in the Apocryphon of John, which we spoke about last week, which she speaks about in this book as well. So, of course, as we're learning with this inversion of the Divine Feminine, which we see from the other side being the Baphomet, that that was completely distorted by the dark cult in order to create God as a, a masculine energy when God isn't human at all. And in, in fact, it encompasses both energies. And then as humans, we share with a counterpart, if that makes sense. Our body never lies. And I got a bearingly clear message written in red rashes across my skin that this was a system of belief that doesn't match what existed within me. So I left the church. Physically, I marched out of the first Unitarian Church of Cleveland. But the turmoil, the anger, as well as the fierce love and longing, it went right along with me. I spent many years at seminary searching through the church's history for when women were silenced, for how the Pope happened, and all these male cardinals in red, and why a popess could not even be imagined. I searched for stories and the voices that had been edited out, or in the case of Mag Mary Magdalene's gospel, torn apart and buried. I remember the first time I led a retreat about the gospel of Mary and started the passage with, There is no such thing as sin. We were sitting in a circle so I could see the immediate response, every face lit up with equal amounts of shock and excitement. There is nothing inherently sinful about being human, I explained. There is nothing sinful about the body or sex or sexuality. Being human isn't a punishment or something we need to endure or transcend. Being human is the whole point. We just also don't want to forget or miss the mark which is how the word for sin translates from Greek, by mistaking ourselves and others as only this body. We are this body, yes, and all the raging humanity it demands. And also, we are this soul, both. Again, this goes back to the Yoga Sutras, which a lot of the Gnostic Gospels mirror the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, where if you are following along with that series, you know the three superstars of the Yoga Sutras are Prakriti, Purusha, and Ishvara. Prakriti being nature, or your body, Purusha being your eternal soul, and Ishvara being God. And of course, the whole point of the Yoga Sutras is actually the definition of sin, which I've known that the original meaning of sin was to miss the mark. And that is that we confuse who we are eternally with who we are in nature, in body, and in life. So this is absolutely a, a direct mirror of what we're seeing in the Yoga Sutras. One of the women in the circle was in tears. I knew from what she had shared during the treat that she was from Ireland, raised religious, and that she had been sexually abused as a child. The warmth radiating from her made me fall madly in love. I'll never forget that joy being beaming out of her eyes through her tears like headlights switched to high beams. And I can't remember if she said this at the retreat or later, when she joined my spiritual community, the Red Ladies. But it struck me because it wasn't what I had intended when I began to talk about Mary's gospel. I just wanted to share and discuss Mary Magdalene's teachings. But she said, you've reminded me of the Christ I knew before I went to church. Liz and I have spoken about this. Kids already come in knowing God, knowing the Christ consciousness. Then we send them to church and they get disconnected from God and from the Christ consciousness. For me, finding Mary Magdalene's voice, her gospel, was like finally attending that church I had imagined church would be like as a little girl. A place where we're not trying to be better than anyone else, or to be better than who we are in that moment. Everyone, no matter who we are, and everything is included, especially the body. I am not Christian, but I recently came across a quote from the English philosopher and lay theologian G.C. Chesterton that sums up what I have come to believe. Christianity isn't a failure. It just hasn't been tried yet. I like that. Christianity isn't a failure. It just 
hasn't been tried yet. So I'm not a Christian. Or if I am, it's a Christianity that we haven't tried yet. One that includes Mary Magdalene. It's the Christianity that existed before the church. Let me read that again. It's the Christianity that existed before the church, which is the whole point of my Missing Books on the Bible series. I'm way more interested to know what that faith was like before the church was created, because from my research, from my understanding, what the true Christianity looks like is nothing what the church provides. It's the church whose doors are ripped off at the hinges. It's the Christianity that includes all that has been left out. So now we're starting the second session, how a feminist sees an angel. The Savior replied, there is no such thing as sin. Rather, you yourselves are what produces sin when you act in accordance with nature of adultery, which is called sin. For this reason, the good came among you, pursuing the good, which belongs to every nature. This is from the Gospel of Mary, chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. There was a legend that Mary Magdalene was lifted up seven times a day by the angels. She lived in a cave in the south of France where she had escaped persecution after her brother Lazarus was beheaded further south in Maricelles. Okay, so um, this is something that we're finding isn't actually true. I don't believe Lazarus was actually the Magdalene's brother, um, maybe, but I think we're learning that that was Mary of Bethany, that that was her brother. And Mary of Bethany, if you remember from the Acts of Philip, was Philip's wife. And also, we're a little bit unsure about the actual location that Mary went to after um, the supposed execution of her husband, the Christ. That, again, is information that will probably be held back for another day. We know that things have definitely been manipulated. And, um, yeah, so I just want you guys to keep that in mind. Now, of course, this is the official story we have, that she went to the south of France and she started the Cathars, which I do believe she did. I, but I, I don't know how accurate the location actually is. So just hold on to that and know that, again, this book was written long before The Great Awakening. And so there are probably going to be a lot of things in here that, I don't really agree with anymore. So I'm just going to put that out there. Supposedly, she had been preaching, ministering there in France for the years following Christ's crucifixion. And for the last 30 years of her life, she remained in this cave where angels gathered her up and transported her to the peaks of the mountain range to the rare filled air where their messages could be heard more clearly. In the artistic depictions of this legend, Mary Magdalene is held literally, physically, by a bevy of angels. Wings surrounded her body, and her hands were pressed to her heart, and her gaze directed even further upward. For example, an Italian Renaissance artist painting of this legend, Mary Magdalene's body is covered only by her long red hair and lifted up by the four angels, her hands pressed together in prayer. Now let's talk about the red hair, because somebody did comment that, and I'm not saying her hair wasn't red, but from information we've, we've stumbled upon, she actually was blonde. Um, again, who knows? We know that she definitely was not Middle Eastern looking. Uh, again, we know she was very Greek. Uh, from what I understand from my own research, her father ruled Egypt through the Ptolemy line, which was the Cleopatra, Mark Antony line. And again, the Ptolemy line is Greek going back to Alexander the Great. And um, so I, I think her hair might have actually been blonde, to be honest with you guys, but we'll see. I think Mary was lifted seven times a day by the angels, but I also think we've deeply misunderstood what this scene represents. If we can find our way back to this legend in Mary Magdalene's story, seeing with a new sense, perceiving with the eyes of, of a heart, we'll remember a truth so many of us have forgotten. We'll remember that this scene isn't unique to Mary Magdalene. It's the vision of a path that's possible for all of us. We'll remember that this artistic rendering of Mary Magdalene is actually a depiction of an inner transformation, of the very real and formidable terrain we cross in order to know who we really are. And we'll remember that an angel is simply a thought that lifts us up from out of ourselves, from out of those cages the ego would prefer us to remain within. I get what she's saying, but I also believe angels are actual entities as well, because I've seen a few in my life. If this is all you've read, if you put down this book at the end of this sentence, know that this is the most important message of Mary's gospel, that we are inherently good. Now, if you're still with me, that goodness can never be lost. We can feel lost to it, but it is woven into the fabric of who we are. It is our nature, goodness. 
And the word for me that describes this experience of knowing this inherit, inherited goodness is soul. The word soul to me describes that eternal aspect of our being, an aspect that allows us to feel loved and to experience that we are love and that our humanity is not intrinsically sinful or shameful. This human body is the soul's chance to be here, that I agree with. When I see a painting of a winged being decked in Greek togas or naked with golden halos above their heads lifting up Mary Magdalene, I see this as a symbolic depiction of an inner transformation. I see it as an artistic expression of a very intimate moment when Mary chooses love from within her. These angels lifting her up in so many of these paintings to me are actually meeting her in her heart, taking her from out of that despair or lack of forgiveness or the envy that's oppressing her and bringing her back again to the good, to God. Angels are the thoughts, the memories, the sensation of love. They are whatever comes and shifts us from being lost within ourselves to seeing again, not with the ego, but with the eye of the heart. Sin in Mary's gospel is not about a long list of moral or religious law. It's not about the wrong action. Sin is simply forgetting the truth and the reality of the soul, and then acting from that forgetful state. The body then, the human body, isn't innately sinful. Sin is when we believe we are only this body. These insatiable needs, these desires and fears the ego conjures. Sin is an adultery or an illegitimate mixing, a mistake of the ego for the true self, rather than remembering that the true self is the soul. Again, this is very much, very much what the Yoga Sutras teach us. The soul lives in the silence, the stillness we have to meet with inside of us, which can make it harder to hear and to find. Words are the ego's favorite outfits. Words are how the ego breathes and fuels the flames of thoughts that start replaying inside us from the second we wake up. Our capacity to see the truth that we are sinless, that we are good, has nothing to do with the eyes. So why four angels and why seven times a day? I think perceiving the good takes practice, and I think we need help getting to that place above the mountains, deep within our heart, that reminds us of what is good, especially in a world or within a heart that has been shattered and has long since fallen apart. Luke chapter 8 verses 1 through 3 is the first passage in the New Testament when we hear Mary Magdalene's name. This is the passage I mentioned that claims she was healed of seven demons. But that, for me, confirms her mastery of the seven powers she describes in this gospel. And again, as I said last week, I think that story is absolutely not what's written in the book of Luke. Um, she was basically attacked for her light, is what I now know that story is, by seven men. Pope Gregory's Amelie 33 with its interpretations of Mary as the prostitute, took off like the hottest possible gossip, as we can imagine, and still reigns as truth today. According to Harvard scholar Dr. Karen King, the reason for the popularity of the Pope's view on Mary and why it has held the collective imagination for nearly two millennia is because it served the early church fathers. This fiction solved two problems at once by undermining both the teachings associated with Mary and the woman's capacity to take on leadership roles. Ding, 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 because we know the church is not a Christian church in the original sense of what Mary Magdalene and Yahshua taught, but it's actually a satanic church. So they want to invert everything, okay? And this is what is still at stake with the vision of Mary. From the first century to the 21st century, woman's spiritual authority within the church has been hard won, opposed, and flat out rejected. The last time Mary is mentioned in the New Testament is in John 20, when Christ rises from the empty tomb to her to say her name. She is the one with the eyes that can perceive him. She had abilities. She could see. Again, she, she was magic. Hermentius. This is a word that changed everything for me in divinity school and in seminary. It means in theology, the lens you use in order to read or interpret scripture. The theological term for interpreting scripture is exegesis. You use a certain interpretive lens every time you translate a piece of scripture. We all do. Pope Gregory did, and that is 
absolutely true. I've told you guys that with the Yoga Sutras. Where you are in your own spiritual development with your soul is how you're going to perceive text, especially in sacred teachings. When I read scripture, I interpret it with a feminist viewpoint. I am reading the text from the perspective that we are all equally divine and human. What do I mean by feminist? There is this quote I came across as a budding teen feminist by a poet and self-professed warrior, Audrey Lord, that made this holy fire race through me as I read it. I am not free while any woman is unfree, even if her shackles are very different from my own. Feminism isn't real or without a device agenda unless it refers to all women. And thanks to the seminal work, The Discourse on the Veil, I am an effective I am a feminist who trusts that each woman has her own criteria of what it means to be free. I don't think freedom is uniform and looks the same for everyone. Freedom is personal. It is explained in the veil that the Western feminists were trying to free Muslim women from wearing a veil without realizing that actually for many Muslim women, it provided a freedom that feminist women in the West couldn't appreciate. True freedom means having the power to define what being free means in our own lives. The brilliant sociologist Patricia Hill Collins defines the term intersectionality coined by Kimberly Crenshaw as the reality that all women are not oppressed equally. There are intersecting factors that increase or decrease the amount of privilege and power a woman experiences depending on, for example, her race, class, and economic status status, sexuality, education level, and nationality. Unless my spirituality is intersectional, it's just oppression dressed in light. A feminist theologian then for me means I believe that every human being is equal parts ego and soul and therefore worthy of the same right. I believe it would do as much harm to call God mother as it has been to call God father for countless centuries. It perpetrates this misunderstanding that any one of us could be greater or less than the other. It feels important to keep expanding our views, our vision on what's good or God and what's holy and sacred. Because only then, as the mystic William Blake in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell explains, if the doors of perception are cleansed, everything would appear as it is. And I absolutely agree with her. Like, that's why I don't actually consider myself to be a feminist, because the feminist movement has been inverted and has been distorted. Um, I'm not looking to be the same as a man or better than a man. My high school English teacher, so honors English teacher, Mr. Saunders said that once, a true feminist is not trying to be identical to a man. She just wants to be equal to one. I believe we're all equal, but as a woman, as a feminine woman, I have my roles. And as the alpha to my omega, that divine masculine also has his roles as well. And they're different but they're equal. And I agree with what she's saying there. We can't call God mother either. It's mother, father. It's both. It's both. The divine feminine is not better than the divine masculine. And the divine masculine is not better than the divine feminine. They are equal. And again, that got distorted with the story of Yahshua and the Magdalene. They were equal. They were both the Christ consciousness. One could not exist without the other. This brings us to the next section, the secret ministry of the courier bell. The mystery which unites two beings is great. Without it, the world would not exist. The Gospel of Philip, which again, we have read through. I will link the Dark Outpost playlist down in the description box below if you want to read through some of these books with us that we've already gone through as far as the missing Gospels are concerned. Every year, at least once, I read the whole book, all 400 pages of it, to get to the very end. The part in Jane Eyre when Jane hears Mr. Rochester's voice as if in the wind, as if from within her. At age 13, the first year I read it, it was the most electrifying and magical idea that love somehow gives us access to superhuman powers that defy the laws of space and time. Jane Eyre was published in 1847 by Courier Bell, a pseudonym for Charlotte Bronte used to obscure the fact that she was female. Bronte's father, Patrick, was an Irish priest and clergyman. As a woman, of course, she couldn't follow in his footsteps, or at least not exactly. The spiritual overturns and commentaries about Christianity were threaded throughout the novel and entirely unveiled. Charlotte seems to have found her way to preach through her pen. She helped me realize that not all ministers have a church, and that maybe women have never really been missing from the pulpit, 
they just found other mediums and other means. There are so many women who were never ordained or acknowledged as a spiritual authority, yet there seems to be a higher law that ordains their voices as among the most holy. Listen to the love-drenched words of, of Sojourner Truth, who stood up at the Woman's Right Convention in 1863 and immortalized her voice because the truth she dared to share. Then that little man in black there, pointing to a priest, he says women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. Actually, man did have something to do with him because we know the whole birth story of Yahshua was an inversion as well. It was supposed to be a dark cult, uh, R-A-P-E, uh, with the incubus and a succubus. And uh, yeah, that, that is, that is, he actually came from Joseph too. But he was birthed through the womb of Mary. So I get what she's saying here. Jane Eyre was the first book among many that I read like scripture because my body with its hives couldn't handle the Bible. I realized that would-be feminist ministers and priests and bishops have been spread all out all over in all genres and in all places, both sacred and secular. Our spiritual voices were hidden in plain daylight, in print, and in places where our ideas of religion, of Christ, and Mary Magdalene were accepted because we passed them off as fiction. Let me set the scene. Jane has suffered greatly from the absence of love in her life, for her whole life. Her love, Mr. Rochester, she realizes too late, has a first wife who lives in the attic as a madwoman. I believe she suffered far greater. Jane's parents die of typhus when she's a little girl, so Jane is raised by her aunt, Mrs. Sarah Reed, who torments Jane by treating her like a burden and by loving her own three children in front of Jane, yet refusing to extend that love to her as well. Jane's only consolation is in her love of her books. The day arrives, however, when Jane is fed up. Her cousin John has hit her and belittled her to the point of humiliation one too many times. He strikes her hard enough that she is thrown to the ground. Jane snaps and sets on John like a wild, feral monkey. Bloody-nosed and crying, John tells Mrs. Reed, and with disgust, Mrs. Reed orders that Jane be locked in the red room. This is the room where her uncle had died. Jane bangs her fist against the door and begs to be released. The red room is where she finally expresses all her rage and anger for being so mistreated and so misunderstood. She screams and cries and eventually becomes so upset she passes out. Her aunt sends her off to Lowood, a harsh boarding school for orphans run by the sinister Mr. Brocklehurst, who humiliates Jane on her first day by forcing her to stand on her chair with a sign around her neck that reads liar. The only little girl to offer her a smile and let her and later a piece of bread is the red-headed Helen Burns. This one gesture is their communion. It seems small, but for Jane, it's a feast to finally have a real friend. Helen teaches Jane that there is an invisible world, a kingdom of spirits all around them. And when Helen finds herself at the mercy of Mr. Brocklehurst's Christian ethics of shame and mortification by demanding that Helen's gorgeous red hair be sheared off, Jane is there to offer her the same true love and companionship. She cuts her hair off in solidarity with her. Fast forward to Jane hired as a governess at Thornfield Hall, and for the first time in her life, she knows love. She has met her match in Mr. Rochester, the one who treats her as his equal. The mad woman in the attic is revealed dramatically at the wedding of Mr. Rochester's wife. Jane is saved by St. John and his two sisters, who are the apostles who are the opposite side of the brother and sister she was tormented by while growing up. They nurse her back to health after she arrives at their doorstep soaking wet and wordless from a broken heart and a nervous breakdown. And whereas her cousin John beat her and never showed her kindness, her redemptive brother St. John, a minister, wants to provide her with a new life, a life of service. At some time together, he asked her to go to India with him on a Christian mission. He wants to marry her. Jane considers the mission but refuses to marry, and this is when it happens. Jane hears Mr. Rochester. And I've always considered it significant that it starts with her heart. It all starts with her attention being drawn to it. It begins to beat quickly to the point that she can suddenly hear it throbbing loudly. When Jane says her heart went still, as if expecting something thrilling to pass through, 
Like an electric shock, Jane describes, eye and ear waited while the flesh quivered on my bones. Jane, Jane, Jane. This is what she hears, but she doesn't know where the voice came from. She only knows that this voice is the one and only voice she longed to hear the most. She calls out to Mr. Rochester to wait for her, and she immediately goes to her room to pray, not in the way that St. John prays. Charlotte Bronte or Fira Bell relates, but in a way that's all her own and just as effective. And because of this moment, this mystical connection they share, Jane returns to Mr. Rochester. He confirms for her that he had called out her name three times, just as she had heard. When the Gospel of Philip says the mystery which unites two beings is great, this is the scene I think of from Jane Eyre. It's a mystery how Jane hears him at such a distance, but seemingly within her. How could she be so far from him and at the same time never left him at all? And it makes me think of Christ and Mary, that we've underestimated the mystery that unites them, that we've been witnessing it in ourselves and others all along, and that we've slowly been acquired a vision that can perceive just how sacred human love is and how world-saving it can become. Maybe this is the secret ministry of Courier Bell. Ooh, so, um, gosh, that's so powerful. Uh, it goes also into this idea of telepathy. And again, this goes back to the twin flame thing. I know for me, I've been experiencing a lot of telepathy lately, like a lot of telepathy. And I myself have been practicing with it too, with people that I know in my life and, and will confirm whether, you know, there was communication or not. And it goes back to that heart center and the fact that souls are united together. And I, again, I go back to Christ and the Mary. This is a huge twin flame topic, one that's big for our timeline now because the dark cult wants to keep the twins apart because there is a vibration there. There is a frequency there that the Magdalene and the Christ had too. You know, one of the biggest myths of twin flames is that your higher self is your twin flame. That's not true at all. That is not true. Um, you, a twin flame, is, a, is, is the same soul that's split into the divine feminine and the divine masculine. And um, it doesn't mean, as Taylor Moon says, it doesn't mean that you're not whole by yourself. You're wholly whole by yourself. And your higher self is an extension of your half of your soul. It's like those, um, you know, those best friend uh, necklaces that you would get that would be like a heart that one would wear one, one would wear the other. That's, that's basically what a twin flame is. The necklace with the half is whole in itself as a necklace. And you as the person wearing it are whole as yourself, just as the other half is whole. But then when you connect them together, they make that, that whole heart. So your higher self is not your twin flame. It's just a higher expression of your half of the soul. Okay, this brings us to the next section. Leviticus in bunny slippers. Jesus said, when you make the two into one, you will become children of humanity. And when you say mountains move from there, it will move the gospel of Thomas. <laughs> Again, this is going back to the whole timeline shift with the twin flames coming together and the fact that the dark cult, we are just now figuring this out. We are the storm. It's the twin flames that are the storm. And they're trying everything they can to keep those powers from connecting together. Because when two, because just as the gospel of Thomas says, when you make the two into one, you will become the children of humanity. And when you say mountains move from here, it will move. That's the power of that energy. Mrs. Von Kloppenberg shuffled around the house in, the, in a moo-moo and pink bunny slippers. She spoke in a whisper as she pointed out the kitchen in the backyard with its odd rock garden and then our bedrooms. My friend Shana was given her son's old room. It spelled faintly of gym socks and it had dark blue walls with tiny sad single bed. I got the immediate creeps, and from the look on Shana's face, she did too. I was given her daughter's old room, which was all the way down the beige, shag-carpeted hall. It had big windows that faced the red rock mesas in the distance and a soft pink comforter on a large double bed. I tried to control my sigh of relief at the sight of it and just smiled back at Mrs. Von Kloppenberg, who was already smiling with an ominous zeal back at me. Shane and I were high school seniors taking part in an internship through a nonprofit that allowed us to volunteer on the Navajo Reservation in Gallup, New Mexico. The Von Kloppenbergs were our hosts for the summer. 
We had never lived outside of our secular homes, so the Bible reading before dinner completely freaked us out. Mr. von Kloppenberg had asked his wife to read a passage from Leviticus to us. She stood up on her seat and read with such fever and excitement about the 76 things that are banned from Christians to do and what the penalty is if they're done. For example, bringing an unauthorized fire before God, Leviticus 10.1, God in this case will smite you, Leviticus 18.2, having sex with a man as one does with a woman, this merits death. Also, as Mrs. von Kloppenberg stood on her dining room chair in, the, in her muumuu and bunny slippers announcing the list of all the do not ever do's for the truly faithful, Shana and I only needed one glance at each other from across the table, and we knew Shana was moving into my room. Every morning without fail, I would wake to the sound of a small pamphlet being shoved under the door and sliding across the wood floor. The first morning, Shana got out of bed and took one look at it and said, Jesus Christ. We were both from an area of East Cle Cleveland with a large Jewish population, so neither of us had been exposed to the come to Jesus intervention like this one. The pamphlet was titled, The Bridge to Jesus. It had a picture on the cover of a woman with her arms up, her face clearly in excruciating pain, apparently from the raging flames all around her. And on the inside of the little missive, it declared that we were sinners, but rejoiced because we were only, but rejoiced because we only needed to ask for salvation and claiming Jesus Christ as our Lord, and then we would be saved. Otherwise, it was eternal damnation, it's screaming and full on flames message received. Gordon House was our guide around the Navajo reservation. We were told that he was awaiting a trial for a drunk driving and vehicle homicide. We had no idea that Gordon House was a household name at this point in New Mexico. His DUI case would eventually be taken to the Supreme Court, and we had no idea that we would be watching a Dateline episode about him when we would return home that next fall. The summer we were with him was the last one Gordon House had on the reservation before, before being sentenced to 22 years in jail. The fatal crash happened on Christmas Eve. He testified that he drank seven beers that night, but that his confusion was from a migraine, not alcohol. He had a documented history of migraines and was treated with traditional Navajo medicine. He was on his way to the medicine man. He thought he was on the access road, which runs parallel to it in the opposite direction of the interstate. He wasn't. He wasn't, though, and he hit a car carrying a family of Christian missionaries head-on. The impact killed a mother and her three young daughters. Gordon House was the first in his family to have a master's degree. He was an Air Force veteran and had been a social worker from the Navajo Nation. At the time of the accident, he was the director of the House of Hope, which offered substance abuse counseling to Navajo teenagers. He was deeply respected in his community, and his pride in that Navajo people was palatable. Our days in Galoot, New Mexico look something like this. In the mornings, Shana and I would be reminded of the eternal life or eternal damnation that awaited us, and that all hinged on our choice to either repent and come to Jesus or continue to live our lives in sin. A little eggs and bacon on the side. And then we would volunteer at the adolescent shelter for Navajo children whose parents or caregivers were in rehab for substance abuse. The kids called us Bilagana. It sounded like it would translate into in into English as something like pretty girl. Gordon informed me with a slight smile that my translation was incorrect. We were being called white girl. Shana and, I, Shana and I as volunteers would mostly listen to the children tell stories. Their imaginations were so vibrant. Then I mentioned this to Gordon and he explained there is no word for imagination in Navajo. A dream or what we can imagine holds equal weight to what happens in real life. Yeah, y'all, yeah. For sure. I've been having like memories in my dreams about actually coming, whew, actually coming to the world in this life. I, I will remember like recently in my dreams, I've been remembering coming down to do this life. So absolutely. After work, Gordon, Gordon, after work, Gordon would pick us up at the Von Kloppenbergs and immerse us in Navajo culture. He took us to places that the Navajo considered sacred and to the sites of horrific battles where the Navajo lost their fight to save their land from the American people. And he told us about the stolen generations of Navajo children taken from their families to the government-funded Christian boarding schools where they weren't allowed to speak their own language, where they were abused and taught to be ashamed of who they are. 
Gordon let us participate in ceremonial sweat lodge and a traditional rain dance. And there was something about being in a sacred circle that taught me the most essential spiritual truth. There is no hierarchy in the spiritual world. The people I sat in circle with in the sweat lodge chanted with, lit sage with, cried with, and sweated for hours and hours with. And the people I danced in circle with in the rain dance called out to the ancestors with and praised the earth together with the soles of our feet were all strangers and different from me. Yet they were strangers that moved me to tears, strangers I loved as I stole glances at them in the heat of the sweat lodge, in the sobering cold of the rain dance, because they reminded me of what I had forgotten. We are all connected. There is no hierarchy in the spiritual world. There is just this circle where the first becomes the last and the last becomes the first. When you make the two into one, that line from the Gospel of Thomas means to me that when you're no longer separating yourself from anyone else, when you are not making yourself in the constant ticker tape of ideas that stream through the mind out to be better or more often worse than anyone else, then you're able to see the ultimate connection that exists between us. When you make the two into one, to me describes an, 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 in, an internal state that affects every relationship. When you make the ego and soul into one, you can no longer divide yourself from others. And this is what moves mountains. Our deeply held, most immovable beliefs, we unify ourselves in love. The von Kloppenbergs drove us to the airport in Albuquerque at the end of our stay. It was the longest two hours of my young life. I can still see the art look of anxiety and fear on Mrs. Von Klopper's face when she begged us from the front of the seat to repent. Her typical fervor for Jesus was even more amped up because of her mistaken idea that Shane and I were sleeping together for romantic reasons rather than the fact that we were just terrified of her. I wanted to tell her what I felt burning inside of me to say since that first pamphlet was shoved under our bedroom door. I felt a raw terrifying anger and witnessing the hypocrisy of religion that sees itself so far above and set apart from others it can justify genocide but it felt like i might morph into a dragon if i opened my mouth and i wasn't sure when or if i'd morph back it was a rage that i didn't know how to express yet without feeling like i'd be consumed by it i never said a word to her but it felt like this tiny, truest part of me was yelling at Mrs. Von Kloppenberg and her Jesus from the back seat. It felt like I could hear this hot molten lava core of what I'd ardently believed with an evangelical fervor equals to hers. It felt like I matched her level of crazy with my own as it sounded something like this. I feel sorry for you that your God is so small, that your God has such a fragile ego, he'll send us all to hell if we don't believe in him and that your Jesus only loves his own followers, people who have surrendered over everything to him like some power-hungry, twisted cult leader. I think you've missed the whole point. You've mistaken God for power. I think whoever the hell Jesus was, he was about love. I think Jesus was about a love that's the opposite of power. This brings us to the second power on page 33 in my book, which is called Craving. The girl who baptized herself. In the tumultuous time immediately after Christ's crucifixion, Christianity is seen as a forbidden religion. It's illegal to be Christian. Yet this crazy devoted man named Paul is traveling from village to village telling stories about his experience of Christ. He happens to stop in a small village where a 17-year-old named Thecla lives. She can hear Paul from her bedroom window and she is riveted. She remains at her window for three days and three nights as Paul recounts his misadventures with Christ. Something begins to unravel for her, or something that had always existed within her suddenly races to the surface, and in those three days her life is transformed. Her fiancé begs her to come away from the window. He tells her that she should be ashamed for directing her love away from him. He reminds her of her duty of the law and he enlists her mother, who begs for her to return to them as well. But Thecla remains. And even more, she begins to want to meet Paul and to leave the life that has been expected of her for a life she now feels authentically her own. Her fiancé reports Paul to the governor, calling him a magician, attributing him with the powers to persuade young women not to marry. The governor has Paul arrested and sent to jail. Thecla leaves her house in the middle of the night to go see him. She gives her bracelets to the prison gatekeeper as admission, and he lets her in. 
She gives an ornate mirror to the guard at the cell door, easily discarding the remains of her old life. He lets her in as well, and then she goes to Paul and sits at his feet. The next day, word gets out that Thecla has been to the prison to see Paul. Her fiancé is beyond outrage. Thecla is his. She is his possession. Thecla's mother agrees and screams for her punishment. Her own mother suggests that she is burned at the stake for breaking the law of her betrothal, for going her own way, for following her fiery young heart. The governor has Paul whipped and thrown out of town. But to teach a lesson, he has Thecla stripped and binds her body to the stake. The pyre is lit, and I've always imagined that she was visibly trembling, but that her resolve comes from a place within her, and it gives her this courage that reminds her of who she is, of what she's capable of. Just as the flames are beginning to reach her, Thecla makes the sign of the cross, and a sudden thundercloud covers her and all the spectators. Rain pours down on the fire that was meant to take her life, and she is saved. She has saved herself. Thecla finds a robe to wear, a robe that was more commonly worn by men, and sets off in Paul's footsteps to catch up with him. A child finds her in the market of a nearby town, a child who knows where Paul can be found. Thecla is led back to where he has been waiting for her, in deep prayer, not knowing if she had lived or died. She greets him and informs him that she will cut her hair and follow him wherever he is led. He's flattered, I'm sure, but also concerned. Thecla, it seems, was extraordinarily beautiful. So he voices his fears that Thecla will only run into more trials as an unmarried young woman in the forbidden religion called Christianity. She assures him, only give me the seal of Christ and no trial will touch me. She wanted baptism and she wanted confirmation from him, her elder, that she was ready and even maybe worthy of being baptized. Paul responds, be patient. So she listens as patiently as love does, and she remains with him at his side. Their ministry leads them to Antioch, an area, of the Ro an area that the Romans refer to as Asia Minor, which was the epic portion of the entire Mediterranean. They are walking down the crowded streets in the center of town where the president of Syria, Alexander, notes Thecla and decides that he must have her, right there as his own. First, he pleads with Paul and offers him bribes of money and power, hoping to appeal to Paul's greed. Paul pretends that he doesn't know Thecla. He essentially disowns Thecla right there for everyone to see. She yells out, wise and empowered teen that she is, and insists that Alexander not violate her. Alexander, being a president rife with power, goes for it anyway, and tries to take her right there in the street. Thecla won't have it. She rips his crown from his head and tears his garments, drawing attention to his actions and subsequently shame from onlookers. Again, Thecla is saved. She has saved herself. She's brought before court to judge her actions and is sentenced to death in the stadium. Thecla again is stripped and her hands are bound. She's led out into the stadium to face her fate. She is forced to wear one word that encapsulates how she has been charged, sacrilege. She is wearing the word sacrilege, standing naked in the center of a packed stadium as the crowd cheers on the arrival of the wild beast that are meant to take her down. A ferocious lion approaches her. I've often imagined that look of love she must have given it. Courage coming face to face with courage. The depth of recognition that must have been there. Suddenly the lion stops charging at Thecla and instead lay down at her feet. Frustrated, the officials send out more wild animals to attack her, but the lioness has now become Thecla's protector, and she mauls each next beast that tries to harm her. Eventually, the lioness is killed, but the crowd has begun to turn. The women in the crowd begin to scream, unholy judgment. They start to proclaim Thecla's innocent and the voice to true sacrilege, which is to put such love to death. In the stadium where Thecla is a pit of water filled with wild sea lions. As more beasts enter the stadium and charge at her, Thecla declares the name of Jesus Christ, I baptize myself, which we know that J sound did not exist back then, so we, she would have said the name of Yahshua. As she enters the water, a cloud of fire suddenly surrounds her so that she can't be touched. And for the third and final time, Thecla saves herself. The women in the crowd now recognize who she is, or maybe they recognize themselves in her. This is the part of her story that I love the most. It's the part that gives me the most hope. 
when the women in the crowd no longer see her as separate from them, and so they refuse to let her be harmed. Together, they throw rose petals, nard, cinnamon into the arena below where she is standing, and the intoxicated perfumes that the roses and spices create lulls the beast into a stupor, and they all lie down and fall asleep. Then the scripture reads, all the women cried out in a loud voice as from one mouth, praising Thecla's courage. In saving herself, Thecla has unified the force of love in all women around her and freeing herself as she has freed them. This story comes from one of the earliest Christian scriptures that has ever been found. It's titled The Acts of Paul and Thecla. Scholars know that it is widely read because so many copies have been recovered, but in the late 2nd century, an early Christian leader and theologian condemned this scripture because it implied that women had the spiritual authority to lead communities and to baptize. The scripture ends by relating that Thecla healed many, that her ministry lasted until she died at the ripe old age of 90, and that she's buried supposedly right near Paul. I think the most threatening aspect of Thecla's story is that she frees herself from an illusion that power resides outside of her. The Thecla who was married off, the Thecla from the prominent family with the weight of her mother's expectations, the girl who was bound by law to become a wife and held no earthly rights to follow the dictates, the cause of something inside of her. She died during those three days and nights when she refused to leave her window and the sounds of Paul's voice. She began to move on her own volition. She began to go against expectations of a girl, considered the inferior sex in her time, and she began to do what her heart was telling her to do. And this was a sacrilege to those in power, that she refused to obey or validate any authority outside of herself, even and ultimately Paul's. She baptized herself because she realized she could. She realized that all along within her, she contained the power to save herself, and so she did.